Hello, my name is Mary Tarsha, and I'm happy to be with you today. Again, I have Dr. Darsha Narvaez, and we are talking about the big picture, how the evolved nest, how those important variables that are critical in the early years, how they are so important in optimizing human development, but now the big picture and how this facilitates the community as a whole. Dr. Narvaez, thank you for being here with us today, and can you please tell us? All right, yes, the big picture. Hi, Mary. How about the nest again? Yes, thank you. All right, yes, so we uh, we can talk about the nest. Uh, we go into depth on, on that in other programs or other uh, yes. interviews. Uh, and how that focusing in on the big picture and how that affects who we become as human beings and how that affects our community relationships. So... Uh, I'm going to talk about four things. One is the nest, just briefly what that means and how that relates to a good psychosocial neuro, psychosocial neuro, and then how that development, that childhood development of a good psychosocial neuro, wisdom leads to a adoption and experience. And then being those adults create communities, maturation and experience, and then in the nest, foster attention to basic needs and communities that live in cooperative companionship at all age levels. So that's what we're the focus is today, and I'll dive into each one of those at least briefly. Yes, I think that's so interesting because I think all of us um, are living in different communities in the United States and other places uh, are appreciative of different aspects and strengths within our communities, but then are also uh, you know, feeling some frustrations at times at ways that we would like our communities to be better, ways that we would like our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and more about how uh, the nest directly contributes to the whole, the whole community. And today, uh, in this uh, segment, we're talking about the positive aspects of mm. it. In another segment, we'll talk about the negatives mm. of uh, what happens when you have unnested human beings and what that leads to. So today, now we're going to talk about the positive. So in talking about the positive, we mean that when those specific aspects of the nest are really met and the child then begins to flourish, how that contributes to vibrant and um, societies that are vibrant and full of justice and equality. That That's right. Thing. And peace, more peaceable, mm. and not uh, going to war at the drop of a hat or anything mm. like that. So let's start. Shall we start with the nest? Mm -hmm. So the nest components, which we go into more, more detail uh, in other um interviews or discussions. Let me just go through them quickly and point out what kind of neurobiological structures they support. Hmm. So one is touch, lots of affectionate touch. And we know that that is linked to uh, mitigating the stress response, keeping babies um, systems calm and in a state of, of optimal kind of functioning. It's uh, related to how the epigenetics for controlling anxiety or caregiver provide. Um, also mitigated by the touch that the parent or caregiver provides is, is what the baby's body expects. And so certain epigenetic effects are occurring, is supposed to occur, that are based on having that kind of support. Mm. And so when you don't, well, I'm not going to talk about the don'ts till later, till another program. So when you do have the good touch, then you, you develop a, a sense of well-being in terms of various systems in your body. So the neurobiology works well because you've had a lot of affectionate touch. And also the next component is responsivity. And that's, you know, meeting the needs of the baby or young child yes. because then they, <laughs> they make that part of their personality. Mm. So you want to have them calm. And then uh, the responsive parent is one who notices those needs quickly before they start crying. You know, when the child is just wiggling funny or making a face, you know, something's not right. And you try to fix that for that baby because the baby is still supposed to be in the womb another 18 months, mm. really. We're born really early up in compared to other animals, and so the systems have to mature and have to develop in response to environmental uh, experiences, and you want that to be an external womb experience in those 18 months in particular. Another aspect is breastfeeding, and that for human beings is a frequent experience because our milk is thin, and so you need to, and the baby's stomach is small, and those 
the, the ingredients of milk. Breast milk is uh, the fuel for building a good brain and body. Precursors for neurotransmitters, for example, are in there. Then uh, building the, the immune system with immunoglobulins and on and on. It's such a magical kind mm, of uh, liquid that we hardly understand yet and yes. people keep discovering oh my god it does that too you know <laughs> so it's really fantastic and for our yes. species the normal from our uh, studies around uh, around the world the species typical length is four years of breast milk you know support that child's healthiest development with uh, extended breastfeeding so we're talking about f um, nursing or breastfeeding frequently, but also for a long period of time because that breast milk digests through the baby system so quickly. Uh, we're talking about being able to nurse um, frequently within an hour, but then also over a long time span. Right. So when the baby is young, they'll probably nurse uh, several hours uh, sorry, several times an hour, Yes. Uh, which mothers think, oh, no, my milk isn't good enough because the baby keeps eating. Right, but right. that's a misconception. The baby is supposed to keep eating mm -hmm. because it's hormones and all sorts of wonderful build a good beings that help them. A different way of thinking about breastfeeding. I mean, uh, from an adult perspective, you have a great meal. It's a heavy meal. And then you're sati satiated for many hours after that. And so we don't think about eating something within 20 minutes <laughs> after a meal. So, yeah, it's, it's different. Right? It's more like drinking water. You need to drink water all day long, right, every <laughs> yes. hour. So that's more like that. They mm -hmm. have to keep hydrated. you got to keep breastfed hydration going for a baby. All right, another one for the human nest. We've got touch, responsiveness, breastfeeding, soothing birth experiences. Lots of trauma can occur at birth that changes the trajectory of that child. So you want to have a soothing experience. You don't separate the mom and baby. You don't do uh, things like that. Then there's play. Babies are ready to play from birth. They're ready to have an interaction back and forth, bantering with a caregiver, and that's what builds their social capacities and their How interesting. leadership yeah. and their social skills to get along with all sorts of other people. Then there's allo parents or allo mothers, people who are responsive caregivers who provide touch and play to the child just like a, a parent would. And finally, positive social support. So that's for the mother and the child to feel like they are wanted, that mm. they belong, that they're appreciated. Those are the kinds of things that that refers to. Great. So this is that are important for explanationizing growth and optimizing human development. But then how does it then participate and facilitate uh, the larger community? Right. So as I mentioned very briefly, it's related to how much, how well one's psychosocial neurobiology develops. With mm. the nest, everything gets started off on the right track. And without trauma or other kinds of um, um, negative shock, experience. negative experience or yeah. shocking experiences, everything is going to go as the species typical, in a species typical way. Mm. And so what happens is you end up with a child who's empathic, who's self-controlled, has self-regulation, they develop a conscience, they develop good social skills, all because the nest has been provided um, sufficiently. Hmm. And uh, that, means, that means that the uh, child then is able to get along with others in a cooperative manner. Oh, when they meet somebody, they're open to meeting them. They're attuned, they easily attune, um, <laughs> playful with others. They show the usual typical mammal young um, <laughs> reaction to play and to run around mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really interact with various ages even. So we're se talking about you're seeing experiences of happiness and joy, uh, flexibility. Also, you're talking about a conscience that so you've been referencing, I'm sure, uh, making decisions that are also based upon compassion and empathy, correct? Yes, that's right. Very good. Uh, part of the nest, too, that I didn't mention is that it's a multi-age experience, that you are mm. in nested in an extended family or a community or neighborhood where you have interactions with different age groups and play. you play with different age groups. So putting kids into a same age group is actually not part of our nest, and we'll mm. talk about why that's bad later. Uh, and part of the nest is also being out in the natural world. So it's interacting with the local entities, the trees, the birds, 
that you get a sense that they're part of your community, that you are committed to their rela- relating to them and tuning into their uh, communications as well. This is part of our Evolve Nest in the bigger sense. So um, do you think that that's how it's connected then? So when we have parts of the nest that are um, adequately supported, then we're having a more intensive caregiving experience within the family, and that opens us up to be more relational in terms of the environment and the world and um, seeing that as an extension. Is that what you're saying here? I'm saying actually that the natural world is part of the companionship that you need with what's, you know, put the baby out, build it into their social awareness and their attunement, that they tune into whatever that is. And we've sort of really lost that immensely in yes. the West. And we get, we've get we told ourselves that nature is scary and dangerous and all. And so there's a missing kind of receptive intelligence to the natural world that we can see then leads to all the environmental degradation. Oh, I see. I uh, see. That we think is okay because you know really only humans matter because we've lost communication with the rest of the nature so rather than being domineering and to dominate the environment really seeing as reciprocity within the environment uh, with i'm hearing you also talk uh, they have that so beautifully when they're able to be in awe of a large tree or um, a really interesting bug whatever it may be yes very nice yeah. And then you bring that into your adulthood, your adolescence. And part of the nest is, uh, as an adolescent, is to actually get more connected to the natural world. Hmm. So in, in traditional societies, especially I'm thinking Native American communities, the adolescent leaves their community after having this wonderful nest that builds all sorts of skills, their, their emotions, their intuitions about themselves and following their own spirit that's all part of the nest too Hmm. and when you get to adolescence though you need to be able to vision quests and going out on your own in the natural world is a way that the adolescent finds out what their gift is or what their skills are or how they are safe in the natural world it's not just about people it also reminds me that there is a sense of training in that and that they are learning to trust their intuitions and to trust their experiences such that if they, um, being in the natural world, they're able to know when there is danger and when there's not and being able to discern between that. That's right. So the the intuitions, and I work with my undergraduate students to help them build their intuitions because they've actually been rather deadened by being in school and and learning from books. Uh, So in the right just sure. memorize this information sure. and get a good score to provide the nest you are actually expecting those intuitions and the individual nature of them to be shaped and to, to emerge through childhood and adolescence mm. and then at this vision quest period when they move from adolescence to adulthood in a way it's a transition they are becoming who they are their unique self and no one else is like them, right? So they get a special name that relates just to them. Hmm. And that's the thing that is part of our nest for older kids. Oh, that's interesting. I also see how um, even in the, our, our modern era here, contemporary speaking, that those are such valuable skills, you know, to be able to trust your instincts or your intuition and your judgments in the workplace, um, to be creative, to be able to navigate um, peacefully and calmly without anxiety through your relationships in different places. And so these are important skills learned through. That's right. And it's a sign of nature, but then we can also be using them in our modern setting. That's right. And it's a sign of intelligence. So it's different. Uh, so it's social intelligence, emotional intelligence. Oh, isn't that interesting? Uh, and we've lost a lot of that. That's why this many school systems are trying to bring back social and emotional learning hmm. because kids have really lost the sense of, you know, audiences learning how to respond to situations for it, their uniqueness or to people hmm. in unique ways for the particular situation. That's also virtue, by the way, right? It's knowing how to relate in the best way possible for that situation. Oh, interesting. You don't use scripts and rules. That's what you do when you're a novice and you don't know too much and you got to, you know, figure things out and basically know hmm. the expert in social relations is going to automatically know spontaneously know Mm. the right thing to do in the right way for that particular instance or that situation rather than depending upon a script or a learned set of rules in that situation 
they have a good judgment in knowing how to respond compassionately or um, reasoning because you're, you're, what you see is possible is affected by what you perceive. And if you have been raised to be open-hearted and open-minded, you're going to see things differently than someone who's been raised to be self-protective and mm. closed down because you've been so unsafe for so long. That then becomes part of your automatic, your personality. You know, you're talking about uh, situations and people. Yes, that is so true, the difference in perceptions. And, you know, you're talking about intelligence, but then it just goes back to that key point that you've talked about before about how the nest really builds good psychosocial neurobiology. And so you're talking about how this directly feeds into perception and intelligence when you're making and right all. So when you're an adult, uh, you are going to end up then with uh, feeling well. Your bio, um, psychosocial neurobiology will work well, and so you get along with others. You're a cooperative member of society, and you end up then growing into wisdom. Hmm. So the ability to be kind and generous and respectful and responsible and conscientious, all those things are part of what becomes easy to do when the nest has been provided. Hmm. It's interesting. So then um, it all begins um, a type of care that is what kind of experiences the mother is having then during birth and then within those early years, how important that is. Right. So it all builds on one another, hmm. right? Because we are dynamic systems as creatures. We are shaped so much by early experience and are as a dynamic system – your early uh, conditions actually shape the trajectory of where you're going to go. So mm -hmm. if those early conditions are are poor, then your trajectory is going to be less than optimal. Mm. Whereas if you have the your positive socially, uh, well, the evolved nest, uh, you are going to have uh, the trajectory that's normal for our species. And what's normal for us it's about what we mean or what you mean by adult well-being. So... Does this refer, I think everyone is in maybe thinking that this also references physical health, but in, more than that. I'm yeah, so physical health, so you're not sickly, mm -hmm. right? So your neurobiological systems are not inflamed, which makes you sick and gives you all sorts of diseases. Uh, you are socially then able to cooperate. You're able to cooperate with others easily. You're able to read them easily and have various habits of getting along with others that are easy to um, employ, deploy. And what happens then with these adults who are cooperative that maintains um, meeting the baby's needs, meeting the young children's needs, attentive primarily to well-being among community members, and that means that they are not distracted hmm. or overwhelmed because they built so many skills and subskills through their supportive development, it's easy for them to help others. You can see this in grandmothers who just love to take care of children. Oh, right. That's a or great grandparents example. or, you know, the ones who are dedicated to the community. It's not a pain. Mm. It's actually their personal goals and their moral goals have merged. And that's what happens when, a, when an adult, a child, has uh, lived through the evolved nest and you become a wise elder who's willing to be a good citizen and cooperate uh, as a leader, actually leading others into cooperation. I'm also just thinking how fulfilling that must be for those community members who have the ability in their older age to then give back and focus not necessarily on themselves, but then on helping others. How What a nourishing and fulfilling experience that must be oh, yes. towards the end of the li their life rather than... Uh, just continuing to focus, unfortunately, on the burdens that are afflicting them at that time. That's right. And that you're able to be generative, hmm. actually help others grow their own uniqueness as the elder, because you've done that yourself. You were, you were supported, and so you pass that on. So the habits and the experiences that you've had, you are able then to share with others. And that's what our species typical society is more like. And, and uh, we can see that in small band hunter-gatherers, that there's much more relaxation happening uh, in community relationships, enjoyment of life, um, just well-being of getting along and, and enjoying being together with others. Wow, 
yeah, that's wonderful. So then this is um, bringing it all together here. We see that the nest and meeting those needs in the early years and having these positive experiences, which really them, then builds this good psychosocial neurobiology of the individual, which really propels that person into adult well-being and wisdom so that in their later years, they can then participate in giving back to the community and focusing on meeting the needs of others, right? And so with that, um, that brings together the big picture in the positive way of how when we are building a cooperative companionship, that this is really our heritage when we are meeting those needs in the early years. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to being with you next time.